Welcome back. You're watching HFO TV. Please join me in welcoming Mark McMullen. And thanks for having me. Uh, my office's our prime directive is the state revenue and economic forecast that we give to the legislature every quarter and the governor, which sets the bar for the budget and our unique kicker law and the like. So uh, what I'm going to do is spinning out of that, a lot of a real 30,000 foot view, first start talking a little bit about where we are in terms of the economic expansion and what we can expect going forward, and then have a couple of these high-level comments about uh, housing markets and, and what we're seeing in terms of uh, some of the, the big headwinds there going forward. So in terms of the, uh, the economy, things are still chugging along. You know, we're a good seven, eight years into this uh, economic expansion now, and as a result, uh, the the economic expansion is, is kind of reached the uh, middle age. And just like us, when we reach middle age, unfortunately, we can't move as fast as we used to, and we're starting to see that in terms of slower job creation and start, starting to see a little bit less of a breakneck pace in growth than, that we had in 2015, early 2016, and, and the like. We have pulled back, but even so, even though we're not growing as fast as we used to, just like with you know old age as a person, a lot of good things come along with it as well. And uh, as the economy has matured or this expansion has matured, now we're starting to see the gains spread out more. Uh, you know, while we're growing slower, we're starting to see more income growth, particularly among our low-income households. That as uh, workers start to find, you know, better jobs at the, at the low end of the spectrum. We're starting to see the uh, expansion spread out of the, our major metropolitan areas to where our most of Oregon's rural areas now are expanding and the like. And it's really starting to get uh, very encouraging in terms of how broad-based some of the gains are going, e even if they're not as fast as they were, you know, a year or two ago. So why is this? You know, why, you know, are we slowing down a little bit? Well, it's, it's about slack in the economy. It's in a lot of Oregon's major metropolitan areas, we've really pulled out uh, all of the slack, in particular uh, available workers. When we were coming out of the recession and, you know, we had all these workers on the sidelines, it was easy for firms to expand and hire. Not only do we have a lot of people moving here, as you all know in your own industries, but uh, we're also seeing workers who were discouraged or had lost their jobs or having trouble finding a full-time employment or the like, all these folks are starting to come off the sidelines and we've seen a tremendous amount of this. But now that we're at, you know, near record low unemployment levels, a lot of this slack has been taken out. And so now we can only really sustain rates of growth that are along the lines of what we have people coming into the state, which is still better than most states, you know, in terms of our our migration trends, but nevertheless, uh, without you know these other workers coming off the sidelines, uh, we can't grow as fast. And it's not just workers; it's it's you know your your suppliers and and your subcontractors and the like. And as these things are harder and harder to find in these areas that have grown for so long, like Portland, they're starting to look elsewhere. In particular, starting to look into some of our rural areas. So the first slide I have in the deck is uh, the job out is the. the recent performance in the job market, which has been good. The dark line there being growth rates in Oregon's jobs, and the light line being the U.S. average. And as you see here, you know, in every single uh, uh, expansion, when the economy is growing, not in those gray areas, but when every single expansion, and if we went all the way back to World War II, this would still be the case, Oregon outperforms the typical state. And we've been doing that again this time around. It, our problem in Oregon isn't what goes on during the expansions, it's that we tend to outperform the typical state in recessions, too. We have these big spectacular recessions, lose thousands and thousands of jobs, and then tr try to make up ground as, uh, you know, as we go. And so, which is good this time, because this expansion has gone so long that we're really starting to make up good ground. And, and you'll see in particular with our incomes. You know, median income in Oregon now is exactly the same as it is in the U.S which is the first time since all the mills closed after the 70s that we could say this. Uh, we're still 
lagging the U.S. in terms of average incomes, and always will, because the main difference in Oregon's income distribution with the U.S., typical U.S. state, is we don't have a lot of super rich households. We don't have financial service centers or the like, or the old money you have in the Northeast. So we really, you know, are missing some of the folks at the really top end. And so in terms of averages, it's hard for us to keep up, but for a median or that typical middle person in the income distribution now, we've caught up with the U.S. as a whole. So why do we have this boom-bust uh, you know, pattern? Well, the two main reasons, one being we're still a place that makes things. We're exposed to manufacturing and natural resource industries, and these are both highly cyclical industries that boom and bust along the same time frame as the overall economy, so this adds extra boom bust to us or extra volatility to, to Oregon. But the biggest one is, is what you all know and feel in your industries, which is the migration trends. That ever since the time of Lewis and Clark, when we have jobs available here, people come. And that's a, that's a great thing. Not just from what you guys do, which is, you know, uh, demand for housing and for pizza places, retail, trade, you know, consumer services, of course all that gets pumped up by more migrants coming to the area, but more importantly, it's this uh, supply of labor for our firms. That we can get skilled workers here at, and at a discount. You know, we don't have MIT or Stanford or anything like that here in Oregon, but if we want an uh, engineer who was trained at MIT, we can get one to come here, and we can get one to come here cheaper than uh, other competitive metropolitan areas as well. And so we've certainly seen that. Uh, the population inflows have let up a little bit. It's, it's hard to follow the population. It's so lag. The data comes out in terms of the census data and the Portland State data and everything that's so backward looking. We have to look at things like uh, school record enrollments and, and uh, van line data and DMV data. When people go to the DMV and turn in their California driver's license and say, I want an Oregon driver's license, we can get some more timely looks. And in terms of that, we're down a little bit off of you know, our peak uh, population growth, but population is still growing and, uh, you know, growing at a relatively rapid pace. And that's a, a lot to, you know, explain this advantage. But as you see here, that advantage is eroding and Oregon is slowing down in terms of its job growth, particularly in Portland and other major metropolitan areas. In Portland now, it's about 1% year over year growth, which is no different than uh, the U.S. average. And this is really kind of unheard of for Portland because uh, we're either growing a lot faster than that or we're in the tank. The one, but we don't really hover at around 1% growth ever. You know, we're either on the way up or on the way down when we get to this point. But in this case, it makes a lot of sense because we are in this mature expansion and we are just kind of constrained in terms of how fast they can add jobs in the, in the metropolitan area. And you're seeing that in terms of, of the slowdown uh, that we've recently we experienced. But like I say, it's becoming more broad based. This chart talks about, uh, is, talks about employment across the different regions of Oregon. So the way, this is a little complicated, but the way to read this one is the far left dark bars are how many jobs were lost during the recession. So Oregon as a whole lost about 8% of its jobs during the Great Recession. Uh, the work, hardest hit places, Central Oregon, Southern Oregon, these were the epicenter of the housing downturn where Central Oregon lost twice as much as the, a typical uh, area in Oregon did during the recession. Then to read to the right side where the light bars go, that's where we are today. So for the typical Oregon area, or the average, they now have 8.3% or 8% more jobs than we had heading into the recession. So, they, so that total swing, about 16 percentage points. And you can see where it's just been extremely pronounced in Central Oregon and Southern Oregon, these housing downturn areas. In Central Oregon, there's over 25% shift there in under a decade in terms of the number of jobs. And if you look just at Deschutes County or Bend, it's even more extreme, right? You cut out Crook County from that, you're looking at about 33% more jobs than they had less than a decade ago. When they were tumbleweed going through the mill district and now you can't get a hotel room. So just absolutely remarkable. But there's even good news at the bottom end there in Southeast Oregon and the South Coast. Uh, all these places are accelerating. Uh, you know, they, they haven't made back all the jobs they lost yet. 
But unlike Portland and our major metropolitan areas that have slowed down over the last couple of years, all, all, most of our rural areas, in particular down south, are, are accelerating. Uh, relative to 2015, we're faster growth in Josephine County, Klamath County, Lake County, Curry County, Coos, the like. Even Jackson County, if you exclude Medford, we've started to see you know, acceleration. So that, that's certainly encouraging. And what's also encouraging is we're starting to see gains filter down lower into the, into the income distribution. I mentioned before that in the new census data puts our median income right there with the rest of the U.S. Here's what's happened to different tiers. I'm looking at the bottom 20% there is under 25000 a year. Uh, the middle is a lot like the median I'm talking about, and then this top percentage uh, is the light blue line. And as you see, now relative to before, even after adjusting for inflation, relative to the, before the, the recession, our low-income households now are doing, doing better on average. And they've just seen just a tremendous amount of improvement in over the last couple, three years. And this is, you know, half of that affordability calculation that we were talking about before, right, is, is the denominator. And as we're starting to see these, uh, you know, uh, lower income households uh, pick up income, even though we're still seeing house prices and rents go up, uh, we've kind of topped out in terms of this affordability. We've started to take some ease off, and it's all about this growth at the bottom. As uh, workers become scarce, uh, what, what do the employers do? They're bidding up wages, and they're starting to look further down the candidate list to folks that are maybe not quite as qualified and the like, and, and starting to uh, have more folks share in the, in the expansion, which is great. And this is where we're seeing all of the growth in households for you all now in terms of the metropolitan areas in Oregon, not just Portland, but Salem, Eugene, everywhere else, all the growth in households over the last five years, seven years since the expansion started has been in this top end. Uh, somewhere above $75,000 a year and up. That's where all of it's coming. And so, you know, and, and you've seen that in terms of where a lot of the investment has been, has been targeted to that. Now, some of that's for bad reasons. If, if uh, low-income households are pushed out to the, the fringes of metropolitan areas, you know, that will lower the growth. But most of what we're seeing here is for good reasons, and it's for this. It's not necessarily households moving physically. It's them moving up the income ladder, which is perfect, right? So going forward, uh, with, we're going to be really constrained to how fast our labor force is growing and how fast we can pull folks in from outside, which is intimately combined with what you all do in terms of housing supply. But we expect, you know, if the U.S. keeps going forward, chugging along, which right now the federal forecasters are all expecting, pretty sanguine about it, about a 20% chance of recession in the next year if you look at the you know, Wall Street Journal forecaster survey and the like, or the F Philadelphia Fed surveys, everyone says, you know, pretty low for, you know, probability of a recession going forward. So if the U.S. keeps going, so too will with we, but we're looking more at the two, 3,000 job a month range rather than, you know, the five, 6,000 jobs we saw during the peak when we were going about twice as fast as everyone else. Well, so what about housing? Well. The biggest thing from the 30,000 foot view is, is affordability, and it's important to note that it's not just, and I'm not talking about affordable housing, but affordability rather, which is just looking at area incomes relative to house prices. Uh, but it's not just an issue in Portland, which we all know, Portland, Bend, whatever. We know, we know there are issues with affor affordability in our rapidly growing urban areas, but at the same time, it's really across the, uh, across the state and all of our rural areas as well. Here we've widened out all the metropolitan area counties and just looking across the U.S. at, at uh, looking at the house prices relative to local incomes. And as you see here, the whole broader Mountain West and Pacific Northwest is red, red, red across the board. So what's going on here? Well, some of it's just part this measure, right? Because whenever we include resort, vacation houses with a lot of external demand, investor demand or vacation homes, it, it, it screws up this comparison with the local incomes, right? Because we're getting a lot of demand for housing from other places, income from outside the area. So if you look at the coast or the ski resorts or, you know, northeast or the boundary waters in the Midwest or the, you know, Appalachian Mountains, the work, you know, anywhere we have this uh, vacation time going or, or the external demand, we expect it to be a little bit more red than the places around it. But that said, 
you know, it's our whole region, and we're, we're not, Harney County isn't exactly a vacation mecca, but it's red too. And in the numbers, this is all on the house price side of things. It's not on the incomes. Uh, Oregonians, the typical rural Oregonian makes about the same amount of money as a typical rural uh, resident in other states. It's all about the, our house prices being in this top 95th percentile across the board. And why are the house prices so high? Well, that's not a mystery either from the 30,000 foot view. It's all about supply. Supply, supply, supply. We're just not getting a supply response that we're used to. Uh, it, it's clear what's wrong, we're not sure why. Something's broken, right? Because typically when you see the kind of price appreciation that we've seen in terms of assets, you know, what, even though it's somewhat risky housing, it doesn't really matter. Investors are gonna come. They're gonna say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna invest, we're gonna build, we're gonna chase these profits. That's what Econ 101 tells you when they're out there to be had. So why, what's stopping this? Why aren't we building? Well, of course, you come to a place in Oregon, the first thing you're gonna hear is, oh, it's our laws. We don't like to build. We've got you know, all these land use restrictions and, and whatnot and different piles of red tape and bureaucracy, and so that's the issue. And uh, clearly, you can, there's no question that over the long haul, our planning uh, environment does add you know, cost and, and hold down supply. I mean, that's what it's supposed to do, you know, sort of that's what it, it's intended to do to a certain extent. But there's something else going on right now because it's not just uh, Oregon and places that kind of maybe don't like to build as much. We, we I, I don't say that, we're not California where we don't like to build. We, we like to talk about building, we just don't do a lot of it. But the, uh, <laughs> but, but if you look at in comparison, hot metro areas that like to build and don't care, like Austin, Boise, these places that are growing and just they're building like crazy, even these places aren't keeping up with the amount of people that are moving in, just like we aren't keeping up with the amount of people moving in. So there's something else going on here. Uh, and I won't belabor a lot of them. Some people are pointing to construction workers, can't get enough construction workers to build right now, so that's holding down. That's harder to see at the top line where we're at because the number of construction workers has bounced back quite a bit. And if you look at, yes, they're getting paid more, but everyone is in the economy. And so in terms of the increase in, in how much you're paying construction workers, that's no different than the typical industry, really, maybe a little bit higher. And so it doesn't look bad. Uh, but anecdotally from folks, there is an issue. And it looks like it's... It looks, when you dive deeper into the numbers, it looks like there may be a bottleneck issue. The issue, we don't have a lot of construction firms, a lot of construction workers, but very few firms. And those firms are taking monopoly profits out. And, to, and that may be going on to a certain extent because one of the things you see in the numbers was that we haven't seen, while the number of construction workers has bounced back, the number of construction establishments has not. Uh, since the bottom out. And what's going on there? Well, we, we lost all these young workers. You know, right after the housing bust and all the workers left the cons construction industry, these folks uh, would be learning their trade. And then right about now, I start to spin off, decide, you know, they're gonna break off from their boss now that I've put in five, ten years of, of learning my trade, now I'm gonna go off and make my own firm, and we're not seeing any new establishments like that, and a lot of it has to do with this dearth of workers in that area. So it really points down to financing. You know, we need lots everywhere, and, you know, but somebody's scared, and I don't think it's developers, you know, the confidence thing. Developers, by their nature, you know, build, build, build. If you're not aggressive, if you're scared, you're not going to be a good developer. But that's not necessarily true of bankers and uh, regulators who can be a little bit more scared, and certainly are, it seems like. The fact that we're seeing lending standards become tighter and tighter on land development loans, just the time when everyone argues we need lots, means there's something working here. If you talk to the bankers, they say it's the regulator's fault, but the issue is this, that okay, well one is, okay, my portfolio, I can't have too much housing. And here at the first couple years of the expansion, you guys, multifamily and commercial was all that was going on. And so they filled up their, their balance sheets with that. And now they don't have room for more housing. Or equivalently, they also are talking about, you know, bigger, uh, larger capital requirements for all your land development stuff as well from the regulators. And so this may be holding things back somewhat. But certainly something's going on and it really threatens our 
uh, primary comparative advantage in Oregon, which is this population growth, a lot of it having to do with uh, the relative affordability of our housing. So just to close, I wanted to make a few comments about what we're seeing in terms of the demographics and the demand for renting. So uh, I don't want to make too much of this, but in terms of the share of people in multifamily versus single family, that share topped out a couple years ago. And we've got this big demographic win that's going to continue to move it in that direction. Now, that said, I again, I want to back off and say in a place like Portland that's growing rapidly, we're going to see m more need for multifamily units going forward. Because of population growth, we're going to need more and more of them. What, what this is saying is talking about, okay, that pie, right? That, uh, that the, what house, the pie is going to keep getting bigger and bigger, so we need more and more, but the slice of the pie that's going to multifamily is going to shrink relative to single family. And it's all about our households hitting their root setting years. Here we see the last couple of years, we've finally seen a tick up in uh, home ownership in Portland and across most of the major metropolitan areas. We're starting to see this, this pick up as we expected, and it's across really all age groups. In particular, the biggest increases, uh, about three quarters of our top 100 metros now are seeing increases in home ownership of the folks uh, that are in their 20s. And, uh, and so you're talking about, you know, the, the youngest, youngest cohort, which is where Portland really stands out. It is this huge bulge of folks just in their 20s heading into these root setting years. Uh, my colleague Josh Lehner put an article together for the HFO newsletter uh, about Portland and kind of comparing this bulge of these 20 year olds to some of the other hot metropolitan areas to show that there's really nothing like it. But the, what that means is we're, the, we're starting to, those households are starting to transition into the point in time when they become more single family. Now we know tastes are changing a little over time, but that it doesn't change as much as this huge shift you see here. So on the right, we're looking at uh, home ownership rates. So from the mid 20s to the mid 30s, right now in Portland, about one third of households are, are own, own their own home. So that's, you know, in those, in those early 20s to mid, 30s, about a third, but then over that next 10 years, that doubles to almost two-thirds of households in their mid-30s to mid-40s own their own home. And so this big bulge in Oregon's demographics, in particular Portland's, is pushing folks into single family and out of the multifamily. So again, multifamily can continue to grow the demand, but just in terms of the share of all units, uh, you know, this is really hard to, hard to uh, shoot, uh, hard to push off or hard to hold off. Some folks say, well, what about the top end? And that, you know, in terms of the old folks, what about older folks moving out of single family and into multifamily? We know we see some of that urbanization, but that's not going to hold the weight either. It, that's particularly important in rural Oregon where they're getting, instead of having that bulge of 20-year-olds, they've got a bulge of 65-year-olds or 60-year-olds. But, uh, you know, on average, we don't see that. Uh, folks don't start to uh, shift out of single family and back into multifamily until you get up into the 80s or so. And uh, that's really, you know, they're not moving it back in the city for the nightlife at that point, right? This is a different phenomenon. And so, <laughs> so yeah, I, might, I usually tell the quip or whatever, that go, 70 might be the new 50, but 85 is still 85. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, <laughs> At any rate, so this is something just to keep, you know, obviously with your industry is something you have to keep uh, tabs on, this huge, you know, demographic shift we're seeing. It's going to move the numbers, regardless of, you know, the millennials' tastes being different than ours or this or that. You know, we do have some of these big sea changes ahead. And so with that, I've used my time. But thank you again for having me. Our entire office specializes in multifamily real estate, making HFO the largest multifamily brokerage in the Pacific Northwest. Your success is our passion. Build your legacy with HFO. Call 503-241-5541 or visit our website at hfore.com for more information.